day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. <laughs> Thank you. 
It always sounds so risky, so brave, so manly to shake your fist at God's face and dare to do anything about it. Because we can always take anything he can dish out on your head. As the people of Samaria were to find out. And when the Syrian armies reached the city of Samaria, the gate was standing to the city walls and the defenses were too big to storm. But the Syrian armies could, if they would, wait. They just parked their battering rams and their workers and their siege artillery to one side, like a cat playing with the mouse, simply waited to bide at their time. And inside the city walls of Samaria, of course, things went from bad to worse. First the food was rationed, and then the, the shortage became drastic, and then the shelves were absolutely empty. There were cases of appalling starvation. And when you hear what follows next, I haven't lived so long that I can't remember concentration camp stories and death marches and what happens to people in whose backyard the last door was fought. And Siberia, the Adams, Pakistan, those are daily words in our vocabulary. And the same thing occurred here. As King John, spying this creature that he was, made his rounds of the city walls, checking the enemy positions, his own defenses, he was stopped in his tracks by the screaming of a high priest, hysterical woman. Flippantly, he thought he had become callous to the cries of the people by this time. He said, Woman, if God can't help you, I sure can't. What he heard next stopped him in his tracks. The woman told the story of how she and her neighbor lady had made an agreement together. First they would kill her son, share him in a meal, and then they would kill the other one's son, share in a grisly banquet. And they did it. Only when it came time for the second lady to give up her son, she, she wept on the deal. She hid the boy. And we're not told it was out of any maternal instinct. It may have been to reserve the unnatural meal for herself. And Joram could scarce believe that things had come to such a pass in this country. It wasn't only the tale that that woman told, but she was asking the court to compel that woman to come across. Joram rent his clothes, and the people saw he was wearing sackcloth beneath his kingly robes. Joram uttered a rash vow. Joram said, God do to me worse if I had to stay on my the hell to be like the prophet. I want you people to see something. That moaning about the consequences of sin is not moaning about sin. That's the sorrow of the world. Sorry that it got caught. Sorry that the bills come in. And always pointing somewhere else at the root of the problem. Where is the humble heart? Where is the penitent soul? Where is the willingness to amend and bow before the will of God? You don't find it in Judah. It's God's fault. He left this happen to us. How does God do such a thing to us? And then he turned on the rock as God's spokesman and dispatched an assassin to Elijah's house to kill him. And in Elijah's house, he and the elders of Israel are talking about the real problem to whom they should really turn for help instead of the political savior. And Elijah is aware, God doesn't let him know what is going on. He says the next rap at the door will be an assassin. Slam him behind the door, and they do. And it isn't long ago, Joram, like a whipped puppy himself, comes into the room, lamenting the sad case of his kingdom. And then, against that black background, 
in those unsettled circumstances, right then and there, Elijah said, Thus said the Lord. Boy, it seems of how odd that thus said the Lord always sounds with thus said most men. Tomorrow about this time shall be sold a measure of fine flour for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. That God's promise always seems so odd, and the clever, snotty, reasoning, and rationalizing of men always seems so smart. I know this myself. When we are in deep trouble, and God confronts us with some great promise, we always try to play the promise down, reduce it to postage stamp size, try to figure it our own way out of the trouble. And every time God makes a promise to you, the test is twofold. A, does he keep his word? And B, do you believe it? Well, the attitude at King Jonah's right hand said, if God opened the windows of heaven and dumped food out, there wouldn't be that much food selling for a shekel in the gate. That's less of a price than we sell it for in harvest time. And to unbelief, the prophet answered, Oh, you see it all right, because you won't have any part in it. Now, friends, what happens next is a miracle. Only it happens in such a natural way that uh, you almost miss it. Everything that follows here is perfectly logical. Perfectly normal, you might say. And that's all that a miracle is, really. It's just that you are given a sudden glimpse of something that God is doing all the time. For instance, the feeding of the 5,000 with the barley loaves and fishes. All Jesus did was feed the price of nothing. One fish, you know, can multiply itself many times. Half thousand, yea, even millions of eggs. And one cubic inch of wheat in a lot of years can reproduce itself to be sown in every square foot of air or land on the earth in 11 years. God is always doing this. The 26th feet of intestinal tract in your body, there's nothing in the world to compare to that food processing plant that takes the protein, the fat, and the carbohydrates and converts that into cell tissue, to energy, and to the biochemicals that your body needs. The miracles go on all the time, it's just that we do not see them. Well, wouldn't you know, outside of the city walls are four miserable people, they're lepers, cast out because of Levitical law. And their plight is pretty bad. They're caught between the proverbial devil and the deep blue sea. And they see it, these four. If they go into the city and ask for food, they're dead because there is no food. And if they walk as lepers into the Syrian camp, well, chances are they'll be dead there too. But they figure that uh, one chance in a million is better than no chance at all. So they said, let's try the enemy. And then they got killed about it. They went way around the mysterious army camp, behind the foothills, to come in the back door to pretend like they were strangers in this neck of the woods. And they did. And while they're going around the hills, though, that evening, the shadows lengthened in the Syrian camp. A strange surging movement began. A shadow here, a form there, a man running here, two more there, and pretty soon, the entire Syrian camp is stampeded. If you've ever been in a crowd of people who've been psyched out or unnerved, unhinged, what did Shakespeare say? Conscience shall make cowards of us all. Here they are torturing the people in the city. And maybe they figure, why are they holding on so long? Have they hired the Hittites in their chariots to come help them? Are the Egyptians on the way and we don't know about it? Are we sitting ducks here in this valley between the mountains? And that evening we are told they heard a noise like a noise like the sound of war equipment on the move. Hunters who have told 
told me that in a valley, in a coulee, one deer, one man walking through the leaves can create some eerie echoes. And pretty soon the whole Syrian camp was fleeing pell-mell down the highway, across Jordan, back home again, drowning their property and possessions as they ran. Well, now the four lepers get there. They look for a sentry. They listen for sounds of an army can nothing. Cautiously they approach the first tent. Carefully they peek inside nothing. And they're hungry. And here, food and drink lie upon the table, untasted and untouched. And they help themselves, thank you. And when they're all done, they swipe the silverware. And then they steal everything else in that tent that they can find. They rush out into the dark with it, out into the woods and buried in the ground, right back into the camp, into the next tent, steal everything there that they can find, back into the woods. And pretty soon, they say, we do not well. This is wrong of us. This day is a day of good tidings and we're keeping quiet about it. Our fellow men are perishing for food and here we are living it up. We do not well. And so they went to the city, shouted to the court, word was carried to the king, and again how reasonable unbelief always sounds. How stupid the promises of God always appear. The king says it is the rules of the Syrians. They just want to stampede a frenzied people out of the gates and then pick them off. Well, some of the servants said it doesn't hurt to chant, and so they sent five men in two chariots. They too took the long way around the Syrian camp. Here they found along the highway paths, coal, vessels, property, strewn all over the place. They came back to the city, and as a great line by the will, word carried quickly throughout the city. And pretty soon, like a dam of water that breaks, the people from Samaria streamed out of the city, fell upon and despoiled the Syrian camp. By the first crack of the dawn of the morning, their business was conducted as usual in the city gate. And when that adjutant, the adjutant general of King Joram, was sent to the city gate to keep order, the surging crowds trampled him to death. He saw that God kept his promise. He just had no part of the result. The point is, people, when you go to your Thanksgiving Day table, old age and sway back with good things to eat, when you count up the blessings that are yours this day, not only as Americans, but especially as American Christians, you remember that you and I have all of those things undeserved as those lepers did who simply came into all of this, not by our might and not by our power, but by God's gift alone. And we do not well if we hold our peace and do not even thank God for that. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.